On today's show, I talked to Jake Fisher from Yahoo Sports about all the rumors around the Mavericks. Are they in on the Siakam thing? What would it take to get Pascal Siakam? What does he want? And what else are the Mavs looking for out there? Could they get a backup center? Could they get another four? Let's talk about all that and more on today's Locked on Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked on Mavericks. NBA champion. He is NBA champion. It's good. And the Mavericks have won the game. You, if you don't believe, you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show. We're making Locked On Maps your first listen today, or maybe your second today. Well, the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day, leave a five star review, like the video, comment anything below. Comment below who do you want the Mavericks to trade for? We are a five day a week and every single post game Dallas Mavericks podcast. If you're here for the first time, appreciate each and every one of you. For checking in on the show, subscribe, see what we're all about, follow the stuff. You can also subscribe to the subtext to get extra content, extra videos, extra uh, news and rumors. I'll text all the rumors that I find to your phone, so subscribe to that. And uh, you can get a 14-day free trial on that if you want to try it out, see if you like it. And you can get one-on-one talks with me and all kinds of stuff in there, mailbags, all kinds of cool things. So check out the subtext, and uh, let's not beat around the bush anymore. Let's talk to Jake Fisher. Welcome in Jake Fisher, the senior NBA reporter from Yahoo Sports. Breaking news all over the place, Jake. You're, you're everywhere, it feels like. Everywhere I turn, there's Jake Fisher. Let's start with this. Pascal Siakam seems to be the biggest name that's on the market right now or potentially available. What's the latest news with Pascal Siakam? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be an ongoing situation between now and the trade deadline where any team you know, such as Dallas that has interest in him whether that be Sacramento, Indiana, Detroit. I mean, Golden State's come up a bunch as well. Um, I mean, any team is going to have to consider the fact that he is going to be an unrestricted free agent this summer. That seems to be the case. Like, no matter where he is, unless he does stick around in Toronto and they re-engage on extension talks, that's a whole nother, you know, kick this can down the road type conversation. But I think any team – that we just mentioned that has interest, they're going to be hesitant to give the full package that Toronto would be hoping to give or hoping to get in exchange for Pascal just with those financial complications. So it's going to be tricky. It's, it's a really interesting dynamic, all those pieces involved before February 8th. It feels like every new star that gets traded now, there's always some complication. There's like, he doesn't want this. He doesn't want this. It's like no star gets traded just like, oh, we want to just change up our talent. You know, it's always like some kind of guy guy wants out or whatever. What's the Mavs involvement so far with Pascal Siakam? Have they made calls? Have they made offers? What's, what's the sense of where the Mavs are? You know, it's so hard right now to pin down just like truly the tangible developments that have happened between the two teams. I can definitely say that there's been conversations. Like, I know that to be true. And I know there are absolutely people in Dallas who really think Pascal is a missing piece that could potentially pair with Luka and Kyrie Irving. And all of a sudden you look up and the Mavericks are a legitimate contender in the West. I also think there are people in Dallas who don't necessarily think that he's worth the potential cost it could take. And their their fears, I think, with anyone around the league who's looking at Pascal about as he ages, you know, a guy who's always been ma- maximized and optimized with the ball in his hands. The shooting was really scary, I think, for a lot of teams early in the season. But now, since the, you know December and January, he's been hitting at a ridiculous rate. I think he's like at forty five percent. I don't know what happens after their last game they played, um, but after the Lakers game, which was I believe Monday night, um, he was. I think around 45 over his last 17 games or so, which that's a different thing. If he's playing at the all-star all NBA form that he has been, then I think you could see some teams as February 8th gets closer to just be like, screw it. This, this title's race is wide open. Maybe we are a Pascal Siakam away from being there. But I, I think with Dallas, it's also, they don't necessarily have like that surefire young blue chip centerpiece to make a deal work so cleanly that, the Knicks did, like, I don't, if, if you just look at things objectively, is there a player outside of Derek Lively, who obviously Dallas wouldn't want to be including in this, that bills the same as RJ Barrett or Emmanuel quickly that the Raptors accepted back for OJ? I know, but that there isn't one. No, there, there's not. The, the Mavs offer, like, 
to me, I've always said that the Mavs offer is contingent on a bunch of other teams kind of like bailing and been like being scared off by the fact that he may not re-sign and then trying to combine the, all right, we'll give you Omax, J- Jaden Hardy, whichever, you know, whoever you want take both of them, whatever. Maybe if they're interested in Grant Williams, they've got a first round pick, you know, just start like trying to piece some of these things together. And then it's, it gets to where it's enough where we see these trades every once in a while where we, we just go, man, really that guy got traded for that. But it's because the rest of the market seemed to have gotten, scared off do you get the sense that that's what the the raptors want for him like they they do want that same kind of package they got for og and Obi. yeah the raptors i think starting really around the showcase december 19th to 22nd when the whole league went to orlando because the g league was there and it's an opportunity to scout 10 day guys and two-week contracts it was really also an unofficial start to trade conversations and the raptors were definitely telling teams and they have continued to tell teams from my understanding that they would prefer to find young players that can grow alongside uh, a future that has Scotty Barnes and now Emmanuel quickly and RJ bear in that as well. So I do wonder if, you know, at the end of the day, just like keep spanning this out to the overall picture, like does uh, um, a Keegan, a, a Kevin Herter, excuse me, does a Kevin Herter as like, a movement shooter that, that the Raptors don't really have is he end up being the best player that's actually on the board for Toronto. Like if that's the Jeez. case, <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if they actually trade him. Cause like, if you look at all these teams, I don't know if the Pacers would, would want to move on from Benedict Matherin. Like I, I, there's definitely been some chatter around him. I'll say around the league. Like he, he is not exactly like the darling that he was in the Pacers eyes. It sounds like from a year ago, but I, I mean, I don't, it doesn't sound like they are really willing to put him on the table for OG. And, you know, you go to Detroit, like is Jaden Ivy getting the Raptors so excited when they already have two ball handlers and Scotty Barnes. And I mean, quickly, like, I, I just think by process of elimination, there just might not be, it's not just with Dallas. Like, there might not be that player available from that, from any of these teams. It does feel like we're just heading towards Siakam just re-signing with the Raptors, right? Like that—that that is to me what it, what it feels like at this point. That they're just like each side's playing chicken, and they're just like trying to create leverage. And the Mavs are used to, or at least Mavs fans are used to, the Mavs being used as a leverage a leverage play. Like, oh, the Mavs are interested in this team. Okay, are they really? Yeah, that, it feels to me at least that's where we're going. Yeah, it's possible. And like from my understanding, I don't know exact particulars, but. Toronto extending Pascal to the full four years max that they're able to, or whatever the maximum four year deal that they can extend him to. I don't think that got very far. I, I don't believe that got very far. If it's February 8th at 2 30 PM Eastern time, and there might not be a trade materializing. Yeah. Could those talks be reignited? I, I think that might, that, that, that would be the frugal situation for, or the, that'd be the pragmatic approach for Toronto at that point. Cause at that point, then you're really worried about having Pascal Siakam just repeat what Fred Van Vliet did and walk to Houston for agency for nothing, which mass fans know that certainly hurts. when oh. you, you, uh, you had to bring it up. The, the Knicks yeah. are here in Dallas tonight. You had to do it. You had to do it. That's why I did it. I, I know what's up. I know, I know what's going on. <laughs> Coming up, is there a sense of what Pascal Siakam actually wants? What do the Mavericks actually want? What are they looking for? What have they made calls for? We're talking about all that and more coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. All you have to do is go to prizepicks.com and you pick more or less on player projections on stats of two to six players. You pick two to six players. You go to prizepicks.com. You see what's available for you on that any given day. You can combine points for in the NBA with rebounds in the NBA assist in the NBA from somebody else. You can also do uh, like NFL. You can go with passing yards. So if I want to go and check out uh, a couple things for the Cowboys, 278 and a half passing yards for Dak Prescott. If you think that's too low, go more on it. Well, let's go more on it. You can also combine that with the NBA. You can go check out and see, let's see. We have uh, Giannis versus the Celtics. 19.0 rebounds plus assists. Ooh, that's a that's a that's a tough one. You think of he's gonna get close to a triple double? I'll go, I'll go less on that one. If I just put down those two, put down 20 bucks, I can win 60 if that wins on the bonus bet on the power play. If I put down five, I can win 15. That's how it works. Go check out prize picks, see what's available for you. And any given day it changes. You're not playing against sharks, you're playing against just the projections. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use that code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's prize picks dot com slash locked on 
NBA. Guess what day it is? Uh, is there a sense of what Pascal Siakam wants? I mean, we know he wants the max, but I've yeah, heard yeah. From, from some people that he wants the ball in his hands. He wants, you know, like on the money side, he wants all the money, right? <laughs> you give, give me the Johnny Manziel money sign. Uh, but does he want the ball in his hands? Does he want to be a number one? Does any of that stuff matter? It's I, think it's, I think it's money. I really do. And I don't, I don't fault him for that. Like no. people are already starting to – talk about oh what's he gonna look like as he reaches 30 like this might be pascal siakam's last chance especially if he signs let's say he gets the four-year you know or a long-term deal that he wants or you know, four or five depending on if he gets traded whatever like if it's if it's a minimum of a four-year contract that's going to take him out to 34 years old like is there really a huge payday coming after this not not necessarily so I, that does seem to be the the leading priority from his side of things right now that where where can i get to this summer not not necessarily even now like starting for next season but where can i be after free agency dust settles and i have as much money in my pocket as possible i mean inflation right like everybody everybody's dealing with it right now the crunch i mean you go to the grocery store and he's like <laughs> i can understand the outcome's point I of think, view I, I can guarantee you that if it gets to that point and there's like opportunities to explore sign and trades like I'm sure there'll be some deck presented where, you know, Texas state income and blah, blah, blah. To try to, <laughs> I'm sure that's going to happen, man. As long as they don't put him in some kind of like cartoon or like some comic book thing, like the Mavs did with Dwight Howard all those years ago. Like as long as they don't do that, I think, I think they'll be okay. Uh, cool. You've also reported the Mavs have just been continuously like just making calls and have emerged as a, a team that's really being active right now. What was your sense on what they're looking for? I just think Dallas knows they're good and that, they're not good enough. Not that they doubt this team can hang with the big boys in the Western Conference, but that we do. You know, I I don't know if they ever really believed Rashawn Holmes was going to come in and be a viable threat to anyone to be the starting center on this team or to be playing real minutes as a rim protector and a lob threat and a uh, you know just overall screening partner for Luca, but he hasn't become that. So I think that's only a natural trade chip to try to look at. And the salary is at least like a movable number in terms of the lack of long-term commitment there. And in theory, he, like in theory, you look at how Taj Gibson, Tristan Thompson, like you can just dust off these big guys and they can come and do something like in theory, he could do, he wouldn't just be dead money somewhere, but as he's not playing in Dallas, like, didn't play in sack before that. I'm not so certain that he's going to have much value. And like, I think also the Tim Hardaway Jr. trade saga with the Mavs has been one to behold being that like, now that he's playing so well, you start to think, I mean, I think Mavs people have started to think, Ooh, like what could we go get with him now? As opposed to, Oh, we need to move off this contract because it hasn't been worthwhile. It's just a funny sliding scale of this stuff. Does it, does a player's value, like I know fans talk about that a lot. Oh, he's he's had a really good like last 10 games or so. His trade value is going up. Does it work like that where the sliding scale literally goes? It's been, we're what, 30 something games into the season with Tim Hardaway Jr. Does his value really raise just because of 30 games? I think it does happen, especially, I mean, it's, it's so funny how perspective is so relative and that like stereotypes from like a, an industry standpoint of thinking really do impact a lot of front office decision making from the standpoint of like a 22 year old coming out of the draft is like old, but yeah. if you know, it's a second round pick and only signs like a two year deal or something, then he's on the market. It's like, Oh, he's only 25, like <laughs> 25 is older than 22. So, and like a guy who has, is considered a bad contract one year, you know, then all of a sudden he's an expiring and then 30 games into that year, on an expiring deal, it's all, all of a sudden he becomes a lot more viable. I think even if um, injury history can, you know, follow a guy for a while, if he can shake that off, like comes back from something, uh, a couple of knee things, and all of a sudden he's a reliable player shooting. Definitely. Like if someone all of a sudden proves to be a viable shooter or a team can convince themselves that that player is going to be a viable enough shooter that that can change some things. So it does happen. 
it's not like, oh, all of a sudden this guy is worth two more first round picks than we ever thought he'd be. But I think the difference of like a guy actually being moved and a guy just being a name that teams are throwing out, like, oh, would you have interest in taking back so and so? I think that stuff that stuff does change. Yeah. I think you've reported this. I've seen this from other places that the Mavs are looking to upgrade at power forward at the four spot and trying to improve that that wing spot. It makes a lot of sense that they would, would do that. Who are the who are the fours out there even being shopped right now? I've tried to go through lists and it's like Siakam. You look at maybe Jeremy Grant with Portland, Kuzma maybe with the Wizards. Like, is there a, Isaiah Stewart's name's been connected to the Mavericks before? Is there a sense that there are guys out there that the Mavs are trying to go get? I think Andrew Wiggins is another name to keep yeah. an eye on. I that, that those types of players, yeah, and no one else that's really come up right now after the list that you said. But Wiggins is one name that uh, I didn't hear come out your mouth so i will add his name to the list there um he's, i don't know i just don't know what to do with him man like he's, yeah. he hasn't been good this season and like he missed a bunch of games last year i just i don't know what to do with him yeah that's what i was gonna say i think to go back to the tim hardaway you know can like wiggins's value definitely changed this year compared to where it was yeah, in your time so you know the, the fact that golden state would be looking to upgrade him or at that spot it also naturally raises the question, well, how much value will they be able to get back? But, you know, just pulling out this thread academically, like that's a perfect scenario, I think, for both Golden State and Dallas, where if the Mavericks can convince themselves that he just needs to change the scenery or maybe they get some back channel, like he'd like to play there. And it's just, it's been brutal in Golden State for him. But I'm just, I'm just, you know, hypothetical, whatever, like that's a, potential depth trade for golden state where they kind of do need just to get different options in that building that they can throw out there. Like if it's two real rotation type pieces from Dallas back in theory, again, this is just two guys talking through computers that, 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 that type of framework I think would make sense for both sides. But I, I'm not, that, that's not me saying that I think Andrew Wiggins to Dallas, write that in Sharpie. I, it's just, it's a, an idea that I definitely heard in the, in the ether. And I, I think is possible as both teams continue exploring their options. In theory, like he makes sense because he's got, the, he's got some more size, which he's not that big, but he's, he's big for what, for Mavs wings right now. Uh, he has been able to shoot in the past. He killed them in the, in the Western conference finals a couple of years ago. It's like he, he picked that one time to be really good in his career. And it was just the perfect, the perfect scenario for the Mavs to get beat <laughs> in that. I mean, he was, he honestly through that run, he was almost their second best player at times running through to, to the finals and, but yeah, his contract, he's making a lot on that, on that deal where you look at it, you go, man, if we get the player that he is this year, that's, that's quite the risk. If you're going to try and take that uh, and try and figure that out. But uh, is there, is there, what's the the market on backup centers? Cause we, we do this exercise with locked on where we, I ask all the other hosts, what does your team want? What is your team looking for? And it's like four or five teams are looking at looking for a backup center. Yeah, no, that's a great point. It's something that I was talking to someone yesterday about that, like Boston, New York, Houston. I think the backup center market is definitely going to be uh, a popular one, for lack of a better term. And, you know, names there. Actually, I'll pull up my list here. I was just jotting these down the other day. Uh, I mean, does a team look at Wendell Carter Jr. in Orlando and think the contract is not so expensive where we could slot him down as a backup who could be an elite backup that could start for us. Clint Capella. I think he's, I mean, personally speaking, watching Atlanta a lot over the last week or so, because I wrote about them today at yahoosports.com. Check that out. Um, Capella seems like he's kind of taken a step back and a step slower in pick and roll coverage and space. Like, I, I wouldn't be so gung ho personally uh, for acquiring him, but he's definitely available. Anyeka Kongwu down the the list in Atlanta. Would a team want to go out and get Jalen Smith in Indiana? Daniel Gafford in Washington. Kelly Linick isn't a rim protector, but definitely a large, large human being who can guard seven footers in uh, in Utah. Nick Richards in Charlotte. I don't know exactly what the Hornets. Uh, like I don't think the Hornets are like desperately clutching Nick Richards. I I I think if you made a strong offer, if you could give you know two second round picks for someone who was not uh, major draft capital out the door for the Hornets to acquire, like I know he's a name that a couple 
people have mentioned to me is like, oh, I wonder like what, what it would take to cut, get him from Charlotte. Not that he's a main difference maker type guy, but a real solid sturdy backup that I think a lot of teams would be happy about uh, acquiring being that he's only on like a three year, $15 million deal. That, that will be very, very valuable. I think if he does contribute in a winning environment as he has in Charlotte, uh, as the new second tax apron stuff kicks in next year. I, I don't know how much of an impact he would make. I just know that the Mavs need something in that spot because Dwight Powell seems to have taken a step back this season and the Mavs are getting destroyed anytime Derek Lively's off the, off the floor, basically. They, they need somebody like that. And all the good teams have decent backup centers and the ones you mentioned are the ones. Is there any sense that the Warriors would look to move Kevon Looney because he seemed to have moved to a backup role They've got Trace Jackson Davis, who's been pretty good for them. But in the past, it seems like Looney is kind of like untouchable because he's so crucial. But now it's kind of a weird spot he's in. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, the Warriors are not good. They're 12th in the West. If you're calling Golden State and you're calling about Kevon Looney, they have to listen at this point. I, I haven't heard his name out there yet, but like without a doubt, he has to be gettable. I, I, I mean, I'd be floored if I checked in with Golden State and they told me, no way, you can't have Kevon Looney right now. <laughs> Uh, Andre Drummond's a name that Mavs fans bring up to me a lot. Yep. Is, are the, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, one the-, the one thing I'll say is he was a name last year, and Char- and Chicago didn't want to move him because they still think that they're a playoff team. And look, they're the ninth seed in the East right now. So I, th- I do think I do think a team would have to give something that makes Chicago think that they're also getting better in that deal to get Andre Drummond. I don't think it's just like a take a couple picks, could take a couple of seconds and we get your guy. Like I think Chicago has, I, I think Chicago still thinks that they're good and that they want pieces back that, that make them stick around this playing picture. It's weird. It's weird to me, but our locked on bulls guys were like, yeah, no, they're not going to just sell off all the pieces though. If they move Zach Levine, it's not like it's a fire sale after that. And I'm like, I just don't understand it, but yeah. uh, there you go. Check out Jake Fisher stuff on Yahoo sports. Go check out his book too. I've got it on my shelf behind me built to lose from Jake Fisher. You can get it on Amazon you can get it everywhere else. Uh, So go check out Jake Fisher's book. I'll put the link in the description. Jake, thanks so much for hanging out with me. Thank you, man.